Citizens UK is a non-profit organisation that constantly reminds people of the importance of civil society by organising communities to act together for power, social justice and the common good. For the past three decades, Citizens UK grew to represent over half a million people across England and Wales and created the nation's largest and most diverse and most powerful civil society alliance. To tell us how campaigning has resulted in improving the lives of thousands of citizens, IOHR is interviewing Neil Jemison, the founder and executive director of Citizens UK. Neil is, without doubt, one of Britain's most experienced community organisers, who after 30 years of service based on community organising, has made the decision to step down in August 2018. Let's go and meet him. Neil Jemison, good to have you with us. Now, in 2016, you were commemorated by the Queen for your contribution to society and social justice. And you were also identified as one of the UK's top 100 public servants by The Guardian. Now, I know this is a difficult one, but if I was to ask you to just choose one campaign that you championed, which one do you think led to the most significant systemic change? I think it's the, it is the work that we do. Uh, People often say, what about the living wage campaign, what about the welcome refugees, what about a whole series of other things. But the campaigns are secondary to the power that there is of organising large numbers of people from groups and institutions into an alliance that is permanent. Mm -hmm. uh, so we just celebrated the 20th anniversary of the East London chapter, which I helped build in 1994 when I first came to London. So that's 20 years of action, uh, highs and lows, no significant falling out. The members continue to pay their annual dues because they get their money's worth, they say. And we have, and you can point to a whole series of significant systemic changes as a result of that they've managed to do. And frankly, every one of the members, of course, the, the, the people who make up these institutions, feels like, because we remind them this, that they're making history. And it's so often that the, these folk, our members, are not seen as history makers at all. Mm -hmm. It's always Parliament or something. You launched the Real Living Wage movement in 2001 and you fought to demand for employers to pay a living wage. It started off as a niche campaign. It ended up as a national movement with the government introducing the higher minimum wage rate in 2016 for people over 25 years of age. Tell me what the biggest challenge today is, especially for those younger people under the age of 25. Well, getting a job, I think. Mm -hmm. But also, uh, many of our, uh, we have these 11 big chapters now across the country, and every now and then they do what we call a listening exercise, where they mm -hmm. listen to their members. And we have to persuade people to do this, because the, the temptation is to say, we know what everybody wants, we know what the problem is. But this lis lis listening process is, it's a bit like consultation, but it's much more significant than that. Well, as a result of that, of the 11 chapters, seven of them have got mental health as their number one issue. And this is new, basically, mm -hmm. and it's particularly a problem for young people, uh, young girls, frankly, because we have lots of schools in membership, mm -hmm. and when, they, when you dig deep in a school, the head teacher may say it's the results or it's the behaviour, or it could be knife crime, of course, but much more significantly is the confusion that young people have about who they are, their identity, uh, their size, what they look like and so on. Let's talk about the state of democracy now in the UK. Can you explain to me how your organisation is working towards expanding democracy in the UK? And tell me about any gaps. Apart from possibly votes for 16 year olds. That's a, it's a um, growing momentum in, in citizens and across, the, in, across England, because of course in Scotland it's possible, but not at general election mm -hmm. time. Uh, that would be quite a good initiative. It's not magic, but frankly, that, that state can only the state can do that. We can't do that. IOHR is working with Citizens UK to improve the expansion of the community sponsorship scheme of Syrian refugees through the Be a Refugee Sponsor campaign that we've launched. Do you think that the government has responded positively to NGOs on this particular subject? I think in this instance, yes. That's partly yeah. why everybody should do it. It's so unusual for the government, the Home Office, that has to do difficult jobs to be in synergy mm -hmm. with what civil society needs. I don't think wants necessarily, but all the evidence from Canada, which I've been to and have seen the stuff there, is the people that benefit most from sponsorship is the sponsor. The families benefit because of course mm -hmm. they get away from the camps and the terrible things they've lived in. 
but for a little church, a little Quaker meeting, a big church, mm -hmm. a school, a public school, there's two public schools now that are beginning to think about it, doing it, they've got a caretaker's house, they're not sure what to do with it. It's brilliant for that institution. Okay. I mean, it's, a, it's, an, uh, it's an antidote to watching the news, which is not dominated by people drowning in the Mediterranean, but it was at one point. It was. You regularly saw these pictures. And actually, it's mostly women have, have come to us. The, we started lots of welcome refugee groups, which were basically persuading the local council to uh, agree to take some of the government scheme, Syrians, which is fine, it's worked all right, but it's temporary and it's not going to last. Mm -hmm. Uh, and it was, I, had, I went to one of the trainings that we did and there was two or three women from Scotland actually who said, I, have, I cannot watch the news if I have no solution to what is like a terrible blight. You see women with their children mm -hmm. drowning in the Mediterranean, we have to do something, which is why we want to sponsor. You have given your life to Citizens UK. Tell me how you think the organisation has changed over the years and what do you think is the biggest challenge that the organisation will face in the next few years? And this work is a vocation, and so it's not one you retire from as stuff. I'm delighted that my colleague Matthew Bolton has got the job. He's from the same stable. He's worked with me for 15 years, and he's perfect. He's a brilliant organiser. In fact, the picture behind me is of an assembly with Sadiq Khan and Zach Goldsmith. It's the biggest one we've done, 6,000 people, really with one request, which is a working relationship with whoever wins. And we do meet with Sadiq Khan on a regular basis, as we would have done had Zach Goldsmith met. Well, Matthew was the organiser that put that together and has done all similar wonderful things. So he's a practitioner. I want to be around, if that's helpful, not to get in the way, but to, to help him support what he's going to do. I am evangelical about sponsor refugees, so I'm going to be a staff member of the sponsor refugees team, particularly working in Scotland. I'm going to Scotland tomorrow. There are no sponsors in Scotland. Okay, well this illustrates uh, who we are and where we are. The red, red dots are where we have chapters or alliances of the organisation. Uh, we started actually in Bristol. I started organising there in 1989, moved here in 1994 to build the East London organisation and then began to accrue the resources we needed to be able to spread. And We have what we call four chapters in London, they're pretty big, uh, about 228 institutions in membership. Uh, and then we went to Milton Keynes and where we went, we go where people invite us and there's evidence that they want us is they raise money for us from their own resources. Usually it's the Bishop or two and uh, put cost, well, we get a lot of money from Unison here. So we, have, we, are, we are growing, which is a nice thing to be in a time of austerity. The blue dots are new chapters coming on funded by the big lottery. Uh, and that will be a particular challenge for us because we are looking for organisers all the time. The craft and the vocation of organising is a serious one and mm. potentially through your own good works and uh, blogging, uh, some people will say, I'd like to be an organiser. We think anybody that wants to be a member of parliament should be an organiser and forget about parliament, frankly. There's plenty of people who want to do that. Mm -hmm. But civil society needs the best. It needs talented people who are optimistic and loves the challenge of going into a city and reorganising it so there is hope and joy and campaigns going on which benefit people. Over here is obviously the yeah. world map and that indicates partly why we're fairly confident about what we do because it's, we're part of an international network mm -hmm. of people doing the same thing which is organising groups of people into alliances to be more powerful. Started in the States 70 years ago by a man called Saul Alinsky uh, we learned some of the with the curriculum we use to, to teach and train our members are, are the same across wherever there's a pin. There's a couple of citizens groups so in here, Australia. Yeah. Hong Kong citizens are just starting. What's going on up here? Uh, Danish citizens, uh, Swedish citizens are struggling a bit, but nevertheless, and obviously lots of dots in um, uh, the United Kingdom. Mm -hmm. 